My name is uh, Brett Little, I'm the Executive Director at the uh, nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. Uh, we're coming up on our 20th year anniversary as an entity here in Grand Rapids that does uh, residential green building education and certification. And uh, we have a couple uh, board members here in the room. Uh, Dave Dye, our chair. Uh, we've got Jennifer over here. Uh, and then we've got our uh, uh, Jessica Baukamp who's on the camera, who's our brand new education uh, and communications director. So, uh, didn't miss any one from DHI, no? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's a little bit about us. Um, just real quick, before we uh, hand it over to, we've got some uh, great speakers lined up. Uh, for those of you who need your Con Ed, uh, head over there and just sign in. And if you need a certificate, we can send you one. If you're doing uh, Realtor or if you're doing um, AIA, Make sure to put your AIA numbers down as well, and we'll get those reported. Um, if you're a passive house person too, we do have this approved for uh, passive house, so make sure to uh, uh, mark that down as well. So, see you use. Um, and then also, we do have a membership. So, if you support our mission of uh, empowering people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live and want to get instant access to our online webinars, as well as green building certification discounts, and several other benefits that we're bringing on. You go to our website and click on uh, become a member. There's uh, corporate and individual memberships as well. And then also, uh, we have a program here in Grand Rapids for anybody developing, uh, whether it be single family, multi-family, new or existing, um, affordable housing, um, so projects that are anywhere uh, helping folks in the 100% area median income range or lower, or supportive housing such as veteran, homeless, youth, uh, senior. That's kind of a long list, but uh, uh, we can help uh, do free green building certification, education, training uh, for anyone developing those kinds of projects here in Grand Rapids. So you can check that out too on our website, and I can talk to you a little bit more about that. So um, we're going to be talking about. Uh, Improving health in homes, and uh, just talking about uh, some different concepts to make our homes uh, uh, healthier after we've made them energy efficient. Um, so this is the quick introduction. We went over just a little bit, uh, but that's all right. Uh, and then we're going to be bringing up um, Panasonic's uh, to talk about the basics of ventilation, uh, and then uh, Bill Equinox to talk about smart ventilation. Um, and then we're going to be getting into um, looking at healthier materials uh, and uh, EMF uh, reduction as well. And then doing a Q&A um, with all of our speakers. So before we get into it, um, you know, just recently I saw this come out. And the fact of the matter is that uh, our air quality, our outdoor air quality, um, to some degree has gotten worse, especially in certain regions. And, uh, here in West Michigan. So the way that's measured is what we call it uh, PM 2.5, uh, basically low-level ozone that's uh, cropping up in certain parts of our country, uh, and uh, of course here um, in uh, in southern Michigan, uh, degrading the, uh, the the outdoor air. Um, but despite uh, that, the fact is our indoor air quality, uh, something that we can all control more is still uh, much worse uh, than the outdoor air quality as well. It's something that we, we really need to focus on. Um, so when we talk about health here at Green Home Institute, we're looking at a very expansive definition of it uh, that's more encompassing. And so we just want to make sure we go over what it means to us when we say health. And so obviously the very um, first one is um, compartmentalization, air tightness, air sealing. So um, if you've been to all of our other Building Green and Beer series since 2018, um, you know, we really focused on energy efficiency and energy conservation. So the very first session we did, I was excited to go and talk about uh, structurally insulated framing systems or more affordable ways to keep heat from transferring through our walls through uh, T-Stud. And uh, Buzz is hanging out back there if you want to say hi to him and learn more about those. So we uh, talked about our wall assemblies. And then uh, about a year ago, here we did um, all electric homes, all electric systems, how they can be much more uh, energy efficient than uh, baseboard heating and then of course even gas systems, and how there's new technology coming on the market where they even work in cold climates. 
And believe it or not, all electric systems uh, add to health because you're removing uh, combustion from uh, the interior space of a house. So there is a health component to that. And then finally, um, we did our uh, net zero, our first ever Michigan Residential Net Zero Energy Conference here, which we hope to repeat next year on May 8th, where we kind of took all of the ideas that culminated together on how we can make homes and buildings um, effectively use zero energy uh, with renewables and energy efficiency. So by doing all of that and talking about uh, energy, we want to kind of move on to the next, um, which, is, which is health. And so we know by having a tighter building, more insulated building, we know that we're going to stop air from moving into the walls where it's kind of dusty, where there could be uh, pest issues, and we're going to be bringing it in other ways and improving the health. Um, there's already studies that show by having those tighter buildings, we're improving health. So that's so that energy efficiency plays right into that, and of course, energy efficiency reduces emissions, which is helping you know aid into our outdoor air quality. So there is all that kind of connectivity from energy <laughs> conservation to our health. Um, the other thing with compartmentalization too, if you uh, multifamily apartments and connected uh, units, uh, what we're talking about is not just energy efficiency, but sealing the units off from one each another. So no matter what somebody's smoking or cooking or burning in their apartment, it doesn't get sucked in through and ruin the air quality for someone else who's living next door. So compartmentalization, when we talk about it, it's very important for health and comfort of occupants. Um, and then of course comfort. So again, when, you know, it could be negative 10 out and you could have the thermostat at 70 degrees and two different people might be sitting right next to it. And one person might be still cold and another person might be just ready or hot. So we know that depending on how well we can uh, keep the outside from getting in through energy efficiency, we're going to also help reduce those issues and improve comfort, which plays right into uh, our health. Um, and then uh, sound transmission uh, is another huge area for health. Um, sound quality within a building, so again, a tighter building, keeping that sound out from either other units or from the neighborhood. And then also our HVAC systems, our quieter HVAC systems, again, keeping things quiet in our house so it's not ruining um, our health uh, through sound issues. Um, and then one we're going to get into here uh, at a future Green Building and Beer series uh, in 2020 uh, with our friends at Disability Advocates of Kent County is accessibility. So the idea that no matter what kind of physical barriers, health barriers somebody is up against, that the health of fully being able to ac access a home, no matter what issues you're in, whether it be permanent or temporary, uh, you can get around in that house. And we think that is sort of another new wave of health and that we want to consider that. Uh, so we'll be discussing that at upcoming events. Um, and then tonight I'm excited to be talking about another area where we kind of apply what we call the precautionary principle and you know, wonder if electromagnetic frequencies could also be potentially ruining the health of some folks, some more than others. And so we're going to get into a little bit of that. So again, when we talk about health at Green Home Institute, um, we are talking about all of these areas. And then, of course, the idea of ventilation, which is typically where most of the conversation goes. But again, it's a huge area to discuss. And so, you know, when we talk about energy efficiency, we talk about compartmentalization, we talk about either building tight or making our building our homes tight. And then we want to make sure we have the proper ventilation to make sure that the right air is coming into the house, uh, not you know, making it full of humidity or drying it out, uh, and making it a healthy space that we can live in after we tighten the shell, whether it be a new construction or a renovation. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, and I'm very excited to be uh, first bringing up uh, uh, Brian Kincaid from Panasonic, who came all the way out here from Arizona, uh, and then right after him we'll have uh, Ty Newell from Build Equinox um, out of the Chicagoland area, and then we're going to have uh, uh, Bar Bobbitt out of Environmental Adaptations kind of wrap up the night. So during the sessions they're going to be speaking, feel free to ask questions during, and then we'll do a larger discussion and uh, Q&A at the end. So with that, Brian, um, I will hand it over to you. Well, it's not often I get a chance to address a group of uh, Michiganders, some people from Illinois and out, uh, to talk about ventilation and uh, beer support. It's not a bad deal. I'm Brian Kincaid, I'm the National Sales Manager for Panasonic Ventilation. I'm originally from the Detroit area. 
We moved to Arizona in 1999 to go where the sun goes to hide from Michigan in the wintertime. <laughs> and we're getting used to it, but I do enjoy coming back. Went out to Grand Haven yesterday just to get uh, a little Lake Michigan water sprayed on me. Oh. Looks like you've got some uh, challenges with some high lake uh, levels. So all I can say is good luck with that. Uh, we get seven inches of rain a year, so <clears throat> have a little different challenge down there. Go on. So my understanding is that Michigan adopted ASHRAE 62.2 for ventilation in 2017, is that correct? Okay. Sorry? I'll take your word. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, our job yeah. here. Yes. And, yes. And Michigan yeah. State's yeah. going to the Rose Bowl this year. ASHRAE 62.2 is a very basic code. And the code for ventilation is it been adopted various parts of the country. Obviously, California adopted it first, you know, one of the first adopters. And, and uh, when I'm out in California, it's always kind of funny because I hear people talking. They're already up to, I believe they've adopted 2017 and they're about to adopt 2020. And so we're talking, this is a level that uh, out west they've been utilizing for several years. Essentially, the ventilation inside the average new house uh, is, and this is according to the EPA, is about five times worse than the worst smog day they ever had in LA back in the 60s. And, and the wildfires going on right now is probably about equal. So today we're going to talk about the fundamentals of, of ventilation. We're going to talk about intermittent versus continuous. Uh, basic formula on how to size your ventilation equipment to meet the standard, and also just some installation fundamentals. Most of this should be fairly uh, new, mm -hmm. or to many of you, you've already been doing this, but it really matters how you install the product, the termination on the product. How many of you are currently HVAC contractors and or builders and or HVAC distributors. Can I see a show of hands? Builder? Builder? Did you ever take a look at the terminations on your ventilation equipment? Yeah, always. Okay, good. Always. Most of this stuff is made in China. And what ends up happening is that the terminations just in and of themselves can add half an inch of water gauge to the static pressure inside the average duct. And all the ventilation fans, ventilation products at the level that I'm talking about, their efficiency is measured at one tenth of an inch water gauge. You know what, you do, what happens to a ventilation fan at half an inch water gauge? Almost dies. It sounds, it's running, but there's actually no air really moving. So that's you know one of the considerations that you have to think about as well as the duct run. Those are all things that I'll cover. So why ventilate? ASHRAE 62, 2, 2010, and 2013. Standard and balanced. You're right now the, the exhaust only portion of the standard, but eventually you're going to make your way to balanced ventilation. Because if you keep depressurizing these spaces with exhaust ventilation, you're going to start backdrafting things you don't want back into the house. Now, many times you have a mechanical room or down in the basement, you'll have your mechanical equipment or outside or you've got the water heater down in the basement. If you depressurize the house, you start backdrafting those, the fumes that you want outside the house. Also, you have to start thinking about where's the air, where's the makeup air coming from? as you exhaust out of the house. Now, when we're talking about an exhaust ventilation fan that operating continuously at a very low rate, people go, well, I'm, I'm losing all my cooling or I'm losing all my heating. Well, no, you're really not. 
I mean, it's kind of the equivalent of a dog peeing in an Olympic-sized pool. It's not that much. But what's most important is having a direct path for your makeup air to come in. Because right now we're just sucking it out of the attic around the downlines, right? That's not where you want your fresh air or your makeup air to come from. So as we're talking about PM 2.5 and we're talking about other things inside the house, the only solution to an indoor air quality problem is fresh air. Now, everybody assumes fresh air has you know, got pollutants or something wrong with it, but it really doesn't. Not anywhere near what we're talking about when we're talking about inside the house. Now my understanding and built um, for Michigan for the energy code we're talking about 1.75 air changes per hour. Does that sound correct? Anybody here familiar with that? Okay, basically, almost two times the volume of the air inside the house per hour is being. Does that sound right? Is he talking for the code? Yeah. Um, we're at four, but I would say people built pretty good around here. I think we get a lot of them to two. Okay. So. Four is good. Yeah. Three is generally regarded as a tight house. But I was talking to a distributor today. I was talking about 1.75, which is super tight. Mm -hmm. So as you are exhausting from the house, you're depressurizing the house, and things like how many of you live in a house or an apartment, you've got an attached garage? You just drive into the garage. Okay, back in the day, the garage was offset from the house. No problem. But now you're bringing your car into the garage, closing the garage door, you've got a super tight house, and it's been exhausting continuously. You open the door, do you ever feel the air kind of go past you? All right, so everything that's been in the garage all day long, plus the car exhaust, goes right into the house, you close that double gasketed door, guess what? You get to enjoy that all day long. It doesn't magically get filtered out by those, you know, $2 filters that uh, go into the mechanical equipment from Home Depot. What ends up happening is it gets distributed evenly throughout the house. So, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that's why the next step will be balanced ventilation where supply air comes in the house, usually through your mechanical equipment, it'll be tempered and filtered. So Brett was talking about PM 2.5. That's the particulate that ends up in your lungs. That's the kind of, yes sir. What about an ERV in the midst of all of this? As, as far as, as bringing in pressure, great. Oh, well, just trying to, to get. No, it's a great solution. Just so happens, we make an ERV. <laughs> now, right now, I think the standard is the MERV 6 filter, but PM 2.5 only gets filtered out by a MERV 13 filter, which, by the way, we happen to have that as an option that you can use in our ERV. But, you know, again, now you're talking about adding static pressure, which you have to overcome. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. We use all Panasonic equipment for DOE work. Great, thank you. This is a pretty, pretty big chunk of Michigan. Where there's 37 agencies in Michigan. They get a pretty good chunk of money. Did you know that you guys are only two hundred dollars off uh, um, to where they'll start using the ER, the spot ERVs in place of those dumbass Asher things that they have? Two hundred dollars. You mean equipment costs? $200 equipment cost off. And we could use a spot ERB because, and that's the, that's, that's the mathematics that we're using. Do you, you work for the DOE? Yeah, of course. Get his card, we'll give him one for free. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the idea here is that you're now, you know, when you're talking about, obviously you're talking about the next up yes. and exhaust ventilation. We've been arguing with more of the subject for no, definitely I'd like to talk to you because we can pencil out the math where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because we can too. But yeah. Don't listen to that. <laughs> we, we, we're, we're talk. Jeffrey Granholm's not the governor no. any longer. <laughs> no, okay. God bless Bill Milliken. 
Um, and, and at the end of this presentation, Brad, did, were you able to get the slide in? Uh, yes, it's okay. in there, yeah. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about some Skunk Works things, which is a wireless ventilation system that will automatically respond to IAQ issues in your house. Mm -hmm. Or, if you're a millennial or younger, you can actually mess with it from your smartphone on an app if you want to. <laughs> so, <laughs> these are the things that are kind of old guys. I, I'll have to focus on why we're here and what we're talking about today. So, why ventilate? Well, you know, you can, you can go without eating for, well, Jesus fasted for 40 days. That's a little extreme. Mm -hmm. But let's say you can go without eating for a couple of weeks, right? You can go without water for, they figure, about three days, four days. How long can you go without breathing? Go ahead, try it. <laughs> All right, so you respire whether you want to or not, as long as you're on this side of the green stuff. So the issue here is that ventilation is important because your house, the house, is a system. Think of it like an organism. The house breathes. In the summertime, the thermal dynamics and the load pressure changes, just like in the wintertime. More humid in the summertime, it's drier in the wintertime. So there are things, there are dynamic changes that happen to the house and inside the house all the time. But it has to breathe. How many of you are Costco members? Okay. Any of you ever buy furniture at Costco? Yeah. Okay. Do you have a fairly new house? 18 years old, 19. That's not bad. That's not bad. Well, the remodeled part was, yeah. All right. Well, back in the day, back when I lived in Detroit, we used to have to pull the storm windows out from underneath the house and put them up in the wintertime. Yeah. Didn't matter. That house leaked in there. <laughs> it was like the front door was open. It breathed real well. Yeah. <laughs> Where 3M actually had that film you put over windows, you took a hair dryer and shrunk it. Again, 3M made money and it was useless. But the point being is the house breathes. You got fresh air in there regardless of whether you wanted it or not. But today when we're talking about 1.75 air changes per hour, the old houses could be 15 air changes per hour. But now we're talking about something that's less than two air changes per hour, and there are Zero net energy builders out there right now that are less than one half of one air change per hour. Whoa. Hey, we're energy efficient. Hey, we're also poisoning ourselves. <laughs> this is a little extreme, but go fire up the car and suck on the tailpipe. Because the furniture you buy from Costco, that off gas is more formaldehyde than what would be acceptable in the United States. The compressor the dog sleeps more. on the chair. Huh? The dog sleeps on the chair. Yeah, well, it's probably unconscious. The thing is, people will buy a brand new house. Let's take, let's take a moderately tight house. Four air changes per hour. And then we go, and we've got all this nice new carpet. Back in the day, carpet was made of cotton or wool. Now it's ground up plastic milk carpets. The cabinets, that's wood. That bar is wood. Now, you're talking about particle board, which off-gasses all kinds of fun stuff into the atmosphere. Which back in the day, when it was 15 air changes an hour, didn't matter. But now, when it's less than four air changes a day, or an hour, excuse me, it does matter. So, that's why ashram. Do you realize that women that stay at home, stay at home moms for the most part, or anybody that stays at home, but women in particular, and this is the American Cancer Society, they have a 54% higher incidence rate of cancer than women that work outside the home. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Well, you can think about it. Health. Are they, 
Huh? How about the panels? Or yeah. that the ventilation standards in commercial buildings where we all work is much higher than what it is in the residential level. So as a guess, how much time do you think you spend indoors? Yes, sir. 80%. You're very close. It's closer to 90%. And in the winter time, unless you're out ice fishing or you're going out skiing or something, it's 100%. You know, you get out of the car in the garage, you get into the house, make that same trip back to the office, or if you work in a group hub, group hub. But you don't get any real fresh air. So, 90% of your lives have lived in work. So, you can't see bad air. I mean, you don't know if the air in here is bad or not. It doesn't, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. Some of you can taste the hops, but that's something else. So we're trying to, ASHRAE is trying to establish a minimum amount of ventilation. And this is just the base part. So 62.2 2010 is trying to change out one third of the air in the house per hour. Now I'm talking over, over the top of some slides here that I'll advance. Did you ever catch flies or butterflies in the jar when you were a kid? Okay, the, doesn't look like the, see the holes in the top of the uh, lid? Why'd you do that? Some of you maybe didn't, now you know why the butterflies in the house. Without doing that, the, the butterflies or whatever you put in there would be dead in a doornail in a very short period of time. Fresh air. Okay? We're not doing that when we're building today's houses or we're remodeling to tighten them up. Double pane door or double pane or triple pane windows, double gasketed doors. That's all to keep the fresh air out. But yet we incentivize to make them more efficient but we're making them unhealthy. That's the whole point. That 62.2 is just the minimum standard to try to get people to have a little better indoor air quality than what they're currently enjoying. So you ventilate. The house is a system. You've got the people inside. You've got the building envelope. You've got the environment. And so really the only way you're going to get fresh air into a new house is through mechanical ventilation. Back in the day, people used to, you know, the first warm day in the springtime, people would throw the windows open, right? Airing out the house. You remember that term? There's a lot of windows in houses today that are fixed. I bought a house, the master bathroom. Couldn't open that big window over there by the spa tub to save your life. There was nothing to get fresh air in there. So the mechanical part of the ventilation, that's how we get fresh air. But mechanical part right now, we're talking about just exhausting what's inside. We're so leaky, a good sized horse fly can fly through them. But now, this is 2010, it's even more, it's even tighter. But we're doing everything for the sake of energy efficiency. But we quit talking about what happens to the people that actually live inside of those houses. That's the important part. You know, there are kids today that. When I was a kid, and I keep talking like I'm a dinosaur, pretty close, but people used to grow out of asthma. Kids used to grow out of asthma. People are growing into asthma. Adult asthma is growing up exponentially. And everybody thinks it's outside. It's because of what's going on outside. It's not. It's what's inside. And again, not commercial spaces, but the homes. The homes with the ground up plastic milk cartons for carpet press particle board for cabinets. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll sell a house with, ooh, it's got granite, nice, nice granite. Well, back in the day in 29, or before the crash, we couldn't, the granite industry couldn't keep up with the demand for granite, so they started getting granite from offshore. And there was, how many of you have seen pink granite in the house? Okay. 
There was a doctor who bought a house in, in Pennsylvania and remodeled it for her pregnant daughter. Now the inspection part of uh, certification in Pennsylvania is for radon. They actually test for radon. They do it with what's essentially a Geiger counter. Everything in the house is perfect. Then the inspector gets to the kitchen with the nice pink granite, and all of a sudden you go, ooh. Now, the doctor is a pulmonary specialist. She goes, what's that? Go, oh, I don't know. We'll go outside and recalibrate. Went outside, got to zero, went through the house, got to the kitchen, went off the Richter scale. That pink granite was off-gassing radon. Right? Degrading materials, check it out. Pink granite is not something you want to get, especially if it's coming from China or the Baltic states. They don't sell it too much here now because we kind of caught up with that and they're doing quartz or silstone, something other than granite. But nobody would know that, right? You can't. I don't smell it. So this is why, again, exhaust ventilation. Multifamily has higher rates. We're 62.2 for single family. On a 2,000 square foot house, might be 50 CFM. If it's a multifamily apartment or condo, 2,000 square feet. Essentially, the square footage multiplied by three instead of by one for every 100 square feet. So what would be 50 CFM for a single family house will now be 90 CFM for a multifamily house or a multifamily dwelling. Why would that be? See all those garages underneath? Where do you think when they pull that car into the garage where all that exhaust goes? Up. So they want to have more ventilation. Plus, you don't know what your neighbor next door is cooking or what's in their house. So you want to have higher ventilation rates in multifamily than you do single family. So how do you meet the standard? So you go all the way up to 2019, we're at 2010. So for the standard for 2010, 62.2 for the state of Michigan, one third of the air out of the house per hour for a single family dwelling. How do you figure that? And that's the terminology, HVI, <laughs> Home Ventilation Institute. You want to look for ventilation devices that have that certification. You know what ASHRAE stands for? For one time. Any so guess? American Society of Heating and Refrigerating Air Conditioning Engineers. Uh, that man will be here. <laughs> Brett, Brett, that's your job. <laughs> <laughs> so I always tell people I'll tell them that one time. Static pressure, are you all familiar with the term static pressure? Okay, it's a fairly astute group, but static pressure is what airflow has to overcome to actually flow. Uh, I was talking to somebody today and I said, on senior skip day, one of the things we would do is jam a potato in the tailpipe of our teacher's car. The static pressure would build up, the car would run like it was running on three cylinders because it's trying to overcome the exhaust gases not getting out, and so now the car is missing. Well, that's what happens with ventilation devices. If it can't move the air out, it starts getting noisier, the airflow goes down, and eventually, depending on how high it is, you won't move any air at all. So you're talking about one-tenth of an inch water gauge. What's one-tenth of an inch water gauge? If you were to take this glass, fill it to one-tenth of an inch, and it was just a piece of paper sitting on top of the device, that would be one-tenth of an inch water gauge. Ventilation devices now are being tested, and commercial devices will be tested all the way up through one-inch water gauge. In other words, how much airflow will it get out with that much pressure it has to overcome? Ventilation fans tested at one-inch water gauge is like testing in cars miles per gallon running downhill with the engine off in neutral. It has no bearing in reality whatsoever. So what really is or what does matter? The minimum now is 0.25 water gauge, a quarter of an inch. 
So realistically, we're looking at 0.375, three-eighths of an inch water gauge, to really you know, figure out if that ventilation fan is moving air. Now, I realize you buy a ventilation fan that says, this much noise sounds, right. this much airflow at one-tenth of an inch water gauge. It's not going to do that when you install it, because the minute you put a duct on it, you've got all kinds of different things, static pressure, the way the duct is configured, the termination. You could end up in, a, in an average house have 0.4 static pressure, 0.4 water gauge. And that fan's only rated at 80 CFM at one tenth of an inch water gauge. We found fans, and I've got a slide on this. <clears throat> a Green Building Institute uh, tester bought nine 110 CFM fans, AC motors, not DC motors, and only five of them exceded 50 CFM when installed. Five. And the fifth one is only 51 CFM, which is the minimum for ASHRAE 62.2. So, I've seen a lot of builders will buy a good fan for 62.2, the one that really works. And then the other ones won't work on its best day. And even, you know, they're rated at 80 CFM. We found them pulling 17, 13 CFM. So, it's not the good one that's going to hurt you. It's all the other ventilation fans in the house. That normally either goes in the laundry room or it goes in the master bathroom. But how many of you have children? How many of you have daughters? How long do they take in the bathroom showering? 20 minutes easy. Okay. I could go into my house in, in the bathroom whenever I was able to. <laughs> and the paint would be peeling. It was so damp. And if the ventilation fan was only pulling 13 CFM, it wasn't a matter of if, but when, there was going to be mold, mildew, and other issues. That's what we're trying to prevent, just for the ventilation fans. And that's what's going into the average bathroom today. So, the inspectors will start to challenge the other fans. Right now, they're going to be primarily focused on the one fan that you tell them is your continuous ventilation 62.2 fan. But if that's your job and the other fans aren't good or don't move much air, something else will come back and bite you. So you want to be cautious when evaluating the ventilation devices that you're using. If you're buying a ventilation fan, whomever you're buying it from, say, what does that actually do at 0.25? What does that do at 0.375? What does it actually do when it's supposed to be installed and running? Because everybody will wash their hands and say, no, that's what it says. HVA says it's good. HVI says it's good at 0.1. But again, that's not reality. So you want to find out, what, regardless of what equipment, you know, you go buy Buffalo tools at, at uh, well, they used to sell them at Home Depot, and you'd say, just as good as Craftsman. Yeah, and then you're out on the job and the thing fractures, you know, like as a piece of, of stone, and you go, oh, not good. And then you can't get your money back. That was the difference between Craftsman tools and everybody else, right? If something broke, you got your money back. So, Ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> so, lab test is 0.1. Typical install is 0.25. Realistic install is 0.375. So take a look at the fan curves. The fan curves will tell you everything you need to know about what the ventilation device does under static pressure. If you look at anybody's, and even ours, you'll find the fan curves in the back. You just find the airflow. You take a look at the static pressure and it will drop you down to the actual airflow at 0.25 or 0.375. But everybody looks great at 0.1. Okay, design airflow will be measured. You've got to have 50 CFM anywhere. Now, ASHRAE 62.2 says continuous can be 20 CFM, intermittent at 50. I recommend running continuous. 
because when you run intermittent, you've got to triple up whatever airflow that you've been running at intermittent. And again, that's where you don't want to cause the negative effect, uh, the, the negative uh, issues that you have with depressurization. So intermittent, they're measured one sum or less. One sum is the equivalent of hearing the wind rustling through the leaves. It's a, you know, it's an arbitrary scale. It's not based on sounds. But one sound is the equivalent of hearing at night with no other noise. You hear the air rustling the leaves outside. That's one sound. That's pretty quiet. The reason why they wanted to specify sounds was because if you're going to run it continuously and you have to have it in the master bath, you don't want the homeowners calling you up going, what are you doing? Okay, guys, tootsie moment. You like noisy fans or you like quiet fans? Remember the movie Tootsie? Maybe not. Yes. Okay, Dustin Hoffman dresses up like a woman to get a job on a soap opera and he gets the job and then he finds out a bunch of things that women know that guys don't. Here's a touchy moment. Guys like noisy fans. Why? Well, because we like it covering up the noise. So my wife will not use the bathroom in anybody's house if we go out to dinner. And I, you know, she'll, she'll be purple before she does that. I go, why is that? She goes, because if I go in the bathroom and I gotta turn on the fan, everybody in the house knows what I just did. To a guy, it's like, yeah, so. Anyways. Quiet. Quiet ventilation means it's actually working and moving air. The noisier the ventilation fan, it's kind of axiomatic. Based on the size of the airflow, it's not moving air. So, single family, multifamily, three stories or fewer. Multifamily, again, you're going to have to go higher up in the airflow. And anything higher than three stories, you're going to need radiation or fire deck. You can learn all you want to learn by going to ASHRAE and pulling up their acceptable indoor air quality and low-rise residential. Uh, if you like reading for fun, this will take you about a year to get through uh, because you'll be asleep after the first page. Okay? So, to just do a quick thumbnail. 62.2 for residential, single family residential. All right, it's one CFM for every 100 square feet of living space. But it's also, you gotta have the occupants. So if you have three bedrooms, they assume four people, two people in the master and then one person in the other. So it's seven and a half CFM per person and then you add in that one CFM for every 100 square feet. So that's how we get to 50 CFM for a 2,000 square foot house. So that's 20 CFM for the 2,000 square feet, and then 30 CFM for the four people in the house. Pretty simple. It's not always accurate, but that's the standard that ASHRAE utilizes. For multifamily, it's 3 CFM for 100 square feet. So that example I gave you, that's where you get the 90 CFM as opposed to 50 CFM. Because now you're talking about 60 CFM in square footage and then 30 for the people in the space. Any questions? We need more beer. Yes, okay, we'll get caught. We'll get, we'll get down here. Spot ventilation is three sounds. Four inch duct is standard, but you're going to run into it to uh, code people are going to say anything above 110 CFM and above, if it's a ventilation fan, they want to see six inch duct. The larger the duct, the less the static pressure. So if you can engineer in six inch duct, think about doing it because it's going to move airflow much better. Okay, you're going to seal the penetrations. You're, you've got to have a quiet ventilation fan that's continuous. You're, you know, you're looking at something that's Energy Star, but everything's Energy Star anymore. So Energy Star is becoming less and less reliable. You're, you're, the people that are buying your products, your homes, your remodels, Energy Star is kind of like, yeah. There's a $3,000 refrigerator, it's Energy Star. There's a $200 refrigerator, it's Energy Star. So what? 
So you just have to be able to understand you're selling a quiet, energy efficient ventilation device. We'd like you to use Panasonic when possible. The 2013 changes, we're just going to kind of go over and pass this. I just want you to know that out west they went from exhaust ventilation to supply ventilation, basically air just being pumped into the house and the air leaking out, which then they figured was a bad idea because all the stuff you wanted out of the house was being driven into the wall cavities. Not good on the stud walls where the, you know, the pressurization actually drove the moisture into the bathroom walls. It's like, what, what is this stuff growing out of the, the uh, outlets? So that's where it starts. It starts compensating, running down the studs. You got hot outside, cool inside. You have condensation in a place you can't even see. So supply ventilation. You want fresh air coming in, exhaust ventilation going out. So pros and cons. Exhaust ventilation is a good place to start. Balanced ventilation is the best way to go. Balanced filtered ventilation. We have, a, we have contractors and builders that in Arizona can just cut a hole in the roof, put a register in the ceiling, put a duct in between the hole in the roof and the ceiling in the kitchen, and that suffices for the range hood ventilation. It's 160 degrees Fahrenheit on the roof in Arizona in the summertime. And one contractor said, well, we could make up a sticker and just tell them to open up the slider door inside. Seriously. So you want to have it balanced. You want to have it filtered. But you also want to have it tempered. Nobody likes to have 165 degrees of air coming down on their heads. So. This is whole house building exhaust. This is talking about negative indoor pressures. Nobody worries about that 240 CFM dryer that's operating while you're gone, right? That's taking air out. So when somebody says, oh, I don't want that fan on all the time, go, really? This is really not that big a deal. And again, I've got a slide that I can show you about a dog peeing in a kiddie pool. It kind of illustrates it's not going to change the temperature dynamics that much. Okay, whole building exhaust. Sorry, I'm going to talk over these. The whole building supply, again, now your pressurization, you're driving stuff into these, the wall cavities, you know. That's, a, that's not a good idea. So the ideal plan for that is hot or hot humid. Keep mm -hmm. out dust and humidity, but it's a problem because, again, you're driving stuff into the walls. So balance, this gives you just a quick illustration. Air in, air out. That's an ERV. We have an ERV that uses 62 watts and is 0.73 efficient. Uses two DC motors. And it's got a MERV 13 filter. That's the end of the commercial. Come talk to myself or Bill afterwards if you want to know more. Ideal climate, any climate zones except could be excessive for temperate, but Pretty much the entire state of California and other states have adopted balanced ventilation. So I'm just giving you this as an idea that it's coming. Whenever you have installations, you may want to start thinking about where would I bring in makeup air? How would I do it? There's a number of companies that have barometric dampers. We have motorized dampers, ERVs, all kinds of different strategies to do it and do it cost effectively. Okay, the ventilation by climate zones. So you've got to have it in all climate zones. Nobody likes to bring in hot, humid air inside their house. You know, what's the help? Tell me what the relative humidity in the house is right now. Go. I go. I don't know. Well, it's 85 outside. It's 80 inside. Oh. Okay. So it's stale air inside, fresh air outside. So. The difference is you got to have fresh air. There are ways to mitigate humidity. Obviously, the fan coil is going to take out a lot. But again, we're talking about for a 2,000 square foot house, 50 CFM continuous on a piece of equipment that's what 1,500 CFM, 2,000 CFM, depending on the tonnage. There's not a big difference. Spot ventilation. Spot ventilation is what we're talking about here. 
ventilation in the bathrooms. You can also do it in the laundry room. Many, pla many places are using a lot of laundry room ventilation because it's nearest usually to the mechanical room and they'll have air coming in and air going out. And that's how they need to balance uh, part of the requirement. I got a lot more slides in there than I thought I did. <laughs> okay. So this is just telling you what continuous and intermittent ventilation rates for kitchen and bathrooms are. Basically, in a kitchen, you're looking at eight air changes an hour, and in a bathroom, 15 air changes an hour. So flow rates. Okay, this is the one. This is a green building. Um, you bought nine fans. Only five of them actually moved 50 CFM. They were all 110 CFM. The point of this is buyer beware. Actually start asking questions. Quality does matter. Your largest exhaust ventilation device in the house is the range hood. There are range hoods now that are quiet, energy efficient, and oh, by the way, can be connected wirelessly to the entire ventilation system so that when somebody turns on the range hood, pressure ventilation automatically starts infiltrating the house and other exhaust devices will start up if needed. The fresh air is distributed through the whole house through all the registers and mechanical equipment and ductwork. Okay, I gave you the calculation. This slide deck will be available, right, Brett? Anybody who wants it? Good. Nobody likes to do math and drink beer. <laughs> Um, unless you're trying to figure out who owes what for the tap. <laughs> Suffice it to say, one CFM for every 100 square feet, 7.5 for every person in there, make sure it's two for the master bedroom. So for 2,000 square feet, 50 CFM. 3,000 square feet, add another 25. This isn't, you know, it's not really that difficult. But again, you have to balance that out with how high are the ceilings, how many people are in the house. These are all factors that we're trying to add into this, but it's a real simple equation. Any questions on math? Good. Okay, there's a table that you can use kind of as a cheat sheet. Again, this will be available. Brett will make this slide deck available to you. Enemies of ventilation, static pressure, we know it's bad. Um, tested at 50. 14.3% were found to have ventilation air flows close to the design level. That's the Florida uh, Solar Energy Center. It hasn't changed that much. So take a look at your designs, take a look at the mechanical ventilation, and figure out if you're on the money. Most of it is the fact that the ventilation fans chosen didn't move any air under static pressure. So this is what happens in installed conditions when they can't perform. A Volkswagen towing a trailer. It doesn't work that well. It's a car, it's a trailer, it doesn't work. This is what you need. If any of you are Dodge uh, people, I apologize for before. But you get the idea. Okay, poor installation, that's not good. That's not really good either. So, you want to have smooth, semi-rigid or rigid, as few elbows or 90 degrees as possible. Those all add static pressure. You put a 90 degree elbow in, add an extra 10 theoretical feet. If you've got semi-rigid, you're going to add more static pressure. The whole point of this is a better installation will reduce the static pressure and reduce the problems you might have. Uh, don't have fresh air intakes in the barbecue. Any questions? Okay, good. All right, outside terminations are especially important. Um, none of which, there's one that's actually <laughs> tested, certified by, by HVI. We can tell you all about it. But make sure your terminations actually work. I probably found one in three, if they have a backdraft damper, the damper never opens. Never. So all you're doing is blowing air against the brick wall and then it all comes back into the house. 
Okay, slight commercial, Cosmos. How did that happen? We lost the other slide? All right. We've developed a system. It's wireless. It will actually have monitors in the house, not like Alexa, but kind of similar. You can put the monitors throughout the house. It will turn on the ventilation, what it needs, fresh air, and it will even use the rain shed if needed to ventilate the house, depending on if there's high levels of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, particulate, formaldehyde, all these things that will actually do this automatically. And if you're living in California right now, trust me, this would be something that would get used over and over again. So, not that you're sucking particulate here in Grand Rapids, but as we tighten up the houses, people want more, uh, you know, they don't want something they have to constantly address if there's a problem. This is a system that works automatically or you can mess with it off of your app on your phone. And you'll see it in this old house. It's in the magazine, but it's also a project. It's already started out there. Thank you for your time today. Are there any questions other than when do I get off?